It's the story of a daughter. It's the story of a mother. It's the story of a wife. Today, live on Restoring Hope. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. Revealing your light. Restoring hope. Open my eyes to Welcome to a live presentation of Restoring Hope Live, a program broadcast weekly on XM Sirius Channel 131 and also on the American Family Radio Network and other fine radio stations across the country. This show is talking about life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Not always the most joyful show, not always the most uplifting show, but it's transparent and it's honest, and it, are, it, it is the stories of real people and what they go through in their lives, and uh, it's an important story to tell, and that story is your story. Uh, it is my belief that within your testimony, uh, there is something that God wants you to pass on to somebody else, and you don't know who that is, and you don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit speaks through you when you talk from that honest place in your heart where Jesus lives, and you'll say something, and it'll make a remarkable difference to someone else. Sometimes we hear those stories. The grandfather in Arizona, the mother in Indiana, the father in the Midwest, the father in the Midwest who was thinking about committing suicide right after the holidays. It was just too tough. Things were not going the way he wanted them to go. He had the insurance. He had everything lined up, a wife and two kids, small kids, And then he heard Mary Ann's story, a story of a wife whose husband was ripped from him through the dramatic violence and sorrow of suicide. And after listening to that 56-minute show, that young man, that father, that son, that husband knew that he could never do to his family what Mary Ann's husband had done to them. So that's what we do here. We tell the truth. We talk about life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and we do that with an outstanding cast. My co-host, of course, is Dr. and Pastor Michael Hartwig. Uh, he is a Baptist pastor and a doctor of education. Right. Right? You got it right. And, of course, we have uh, Eric uh, producing the audio today and Maddie producing the video. And our special guest today is Jane. Now, one of the things that has to happen on this show, and for those of you that are uh, only listening to this and not watching it, because you can also go to RestoringHopeLive.com and you can watch this program. Uh, We don't say we are television. We say we are passionate radio with pictures. And that is what Maddie's doing. Maddie is producing the visual portion of this, and you can always pull that podcast down. But every once in a while, we have someone that needs to be anonymous. Their professional life, the life they have within their family or their church, requires them or they desire to just tell their story. And I honor that. I've known this young lady for many years. I've known her husband for many years. You have to trust me when I tell you this is a real person and a real story. But because of anonymity. You didn't say it right. Anonymity. Anonymity. Thank you, Jane. Jane got it. Uh, You won't see her beautiful face. So, Jane, welcome to the show today. Thank you. You look great today. You're kind of beaming. That's what I've been hearing (laughs) over the past few months is that I'm beaming. Yeah, you are. You're just kind of beaming. Life's great. Yeah, it is, isn't it? But life wasn't so great not too long ago. Very true. Let's start out with uh, um, what was home life like? as you were growing up, concerning alcoholism and the use of alcohol and things like that? Sure. Um, I grew up in a a typical home. There were five kids in our family, Uh, parents married, um, wonderful upbringing, very loving home. Alcohol was not around. I'd see my parents have a glass of wine on New Year's with friends, uh, maybe a beer watching a football game every now and then, but it was not a regular part of our home. And um, no alcoholism that I knew of in our family. Yeah, anywhere. Anywhere. And when did you start to drink? 16. 16. Just peer pressure, or did you actually like it? I liked it. Did you? I liked it from the beginning. I had a great group of friends, and 
we were all the straight A students. Um, nobody would think we were hanging out on the weekends drinking, but we were. Do you um, remember that first drink? Yeah. Okay, tell me about it. It was fun. It was actually, the tradition in our house was on New Year's Eve, uh, you could have a glass of wine with dinner. And my parents encouraged us to stay at home for many, many years uh, by cooking a beautiful steak dinner with the family on New Year's sure. Eve. And you could have a glass of wine. And um, I remember in high school, I'd gone out with my friends. And at the time, I had a boyfriend who was drinking, but I wasn't. And so he had a few drinks. It wasn't crazy drinking. It had some drinks. So came back to our house to unwind. Uh, it's probably 1230, 1 o'clock in the morning. And um, my family was still up. They'd had some friends over. But uh, again, nobody was drunk. Um, and my boyfriend said, well, ask if you could have your glass of wine you didn't have with dinner. Ask if you could have it. And uh, mm -hmm. I said, okay. And so I did. My mom said, well, okay. And I went in the kitchen and I downed it. And he said, okay, now go pour yourself another one. Mm -hmm. And I went back in the kitchen. I did that maybe three times. Wow. And I thought, well, this is fun. Yeah. And um, and so it wasn't, uh, I just enjoyed how it made me feel. And, and how, 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 how would you uh, say it made you feel? How do you describe that? Well, I didn't know until I was in my 30s that I have anxiety. Okay. And so growing up, I thought that my, what I call an anxious personality now, always was a driving personality, an intense personality, where that's how I could get straight A's. That's how I could handle sure. pressure was just go, 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 do, do, do. And it wasn't until, um, and this is part of my story later on, I wanted to just calm down without having to rely on something that um, I realized that that's what the alcohol was doing for me. And I felt it the instant I started drinking when I was Calm back when I was 16. Okay. So the um, uh, rest of high school, then you went to college. Mm -hmm. Did the drinking increase when you went to college? It was about the same. But, uh, high school and college, I always had a close group of friends. Drinking was something we did, you know, Friday and Saturday nights, sometimes on Thursdays, sometimes on Sunday nights. But it was never out of control. I went to a small private college. Um, and so it wasn't the frat party scene that you'd see at a big school. My story might be different if I had gone into that type of environment. So I was always with cl close friends. We were no driving wasn't an issue um, because we were always on campus or close by. I um, didn't feel like it was a issue for them for you then. I always point. drank more than the other people I was with. Yeah. Um, now, do you, did you notice that then or as you look back now? A little bit of both. I definitely noticed it looking back now. But at the time, I th just thought, I just enjoy this a lot. And, and hey, I'm doing fine in life and everybody's drinking. And I just happen to drink more than other people. But I was never, you know, face down at a party puking. Okay. Um, I just it made sure it was a part of my weekend. Can you think back at that time? Can you think back of other alcoholics? Did you ever think that? Oh, yes. they're, they're an alcoholic. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't know that word. You decided. I they really, can't I thought it. alcoholics were old men under the gutter or mm. in, un, yeah. under the bridge, yeah. uh, face in the gutter. I did not think of that as I grew up in a nice Midwest American home, and I'm a straight A student. I did. It was not even a word that mm. was in my vocabulary. Mm. Looking back now, I have some friends from college who have said, "Oh, I got sober." And um, we find a, a nice relationship there. because. Mm. But looking back, yeah, I can see the tendency of always being the last ones at the parties, mm. always being the ones going, oh, let's have another round. You know, always that, not wanting to stop. The but fun person. The fun person. But in college, that wasn't con considered a problem. Yeah. And, and you didn't become a problem for somebody. They had to take you home or, uh, you know, because a lot of times the first sign that somebody has a drinking problem is everybody else has to enable them. Right. They can't take care of themselves. But that wasn't you in that college. That wasn't me in college, no. All right. We're telling Jane's story today. Uh, and uh, it's going to get a little worse. And then it's going to get really good. Jesus shows up. You wait in here. We want to thank our friends at uh, Transformations in Florida. They are the people that bring this program to you, and they make it possible. Go to our website at Restoring Hope Live and read all about Transformations. It might be the place you've been praying for, for your daughter or your son or your spouse or your best friend or your pastor or maybe you. Check them out. Transformations at RestoringHopeLive.com. I'm J. Michael McCoy. We're coming back live here on XM Cirrus and American Family Radio.
across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program, Transformations. Change your life, change your relationships, transform your world. Learn more now at RestoringHopeLive.com. The Pocket Testament League presents Pocket Power. Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. Tongue-tied when it comes to witnessing? Then let God's Word do the talking for you. My local youth group will feed and hang out with the homeless downtown. Such a cosmopolitan city is a huge meeting place for people of all walks of life, and having access to God's Word would be a huge help. The truth has to be shared. Hello, this is Mike Brickley, president of the Pocket Testament League. Reading the Bible every day is so easy when you always have it with you. You won't even need a backpack. You can carry one right in your pocket. What are you waiting for? Our Women's Fellowship has sponsored a car wash to raise money, but we also want to use this opportunity to share the gospel. That will be our thank you. Praise the Lord for having these testaments available. What are you waiting for? Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. For more information, call 1-800-636-8785 or visit pocketpower.org. That's pocketpower.org. A Marriage Moment with Dr. Mike Hartwig for Marriage Matters Live. A husband once told us that his wife wanted him to be more romantic, but that she doesn't want him to spend any extra money on her. He wondered what to do. It's easy to get so focused on money that we forget that some of the best things in life are free. If you're on a tight budget, you can forego the movie and dinner and still have a great time with each other. When Leanne and I were in college, we used to go out just about every weekend, and very seldom would we spend a ton of money. We couldn't. Strong couples realize that it's not the activity that you do, but it's being together that is all important. Some of the best times that we've had together is just going to the park or the mall and watching people. Whatever the case, don't fall into the trap that you have to spend a ton of money to have a great date. This Marriage Moment and Marriage Matters Live is a ministry of Restoring Hope Live, heard Sundays on this station. Restoring Hope. So, you know, I'm a dog, and I'm kind of new to this family, but I've noticed a trend. My humans do this thing where they go around and get all my toys and hide them in this basket, but it's always the same basket, and it's always the same place. And then they act so surprised when I find them, but I'm like, hello, that's where you put it last time. Humans are the worst at hide-and-go-seek. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Today, millions are struggling with alcohol or drug addiction. If you or people you know struggle with a chemical dependency where a substance owns you and you have other struggles such as depression, anxiety, or trauma that can often go along with it, get your freedom back and successfully transform your life from one controlled by addiction to a clean, sober, fulfilling life. Contact Transformations Treatment Center, where our caring professionals will help you find your freedom. Transformations Treatment Center offers both a 12-step and a Christian 12-step program, providing healing for the mind, body, and spirit. At Transformations Treatment Center, we understand the pain. Get your freedom back. Transform your world. Addiction specialists are ready to take your call. Call now, 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. Restoring hope. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. after the hour. Welcome back to this edition of RestoringHopeLive.com. We appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to come in. We're hearing uh, Jane's story today, and we'll get back with that in just a minute. Uh, for those of you that have not seen the movie God's Not Dead yet, have you seen I have it? not. You have, you have you? I have not. Anybody in there seen it yet? Nope. All right. It's, it's a great movie. Uh, Steve Dace, who was a friend of mine, a national broadcaster, actually posted on Facebook a review, and it was a very well-written review. But I want to share a little story with you for a minute. 
for years and years and years, a bunch of guys got together at my house every Saturday afternoon, and we played tournament poker. And we we did this to practice on our Texas Hold'em. This is when Texas Hold'em was such a big deal. And you got to be accomplished at that. Didn't you win the state title or something like that? Thank you, I did. You were a gambler. I, That's I, why no, you're in radio. No, I'm not a gambler. I, because <laughs> Well, but to, to be honest with you, there is a difference between playing a cash poker game and a tournament game. Because a tournament game, you put in an, an admission fee, right, like you right, go to the right, movies, like, like a tennis, yeah, tennis and match. that's all the money you're going to put right, in. Right. I'm not, I've never ever, well, not that I've never, but I don't like playing cash poker. I think right. that's gambling, and I don't like that. But the point was, a whole bunch of us would get together on a Saturday afternoon, and we would uh, uh, practice, and I'd bring in really good players from right. around the area so people could practice with good players. And there was a guy there, and Mike, uh, if you met this guy, I, yeah, I know who you could. Talk you'd about, love yeah. this guy. You'd want your daughter to date him. He was yeah. a wonderful guy, sweet guy. Uh, uh, never got mad when he lost. Always pleasant. Hung around. I probably spent fifteen thousand hours with this guy over ten years. But Mike had one fault. Uh, he didn't know his creator. In fact, he was one of those mockers of our religion. And the only time Mike would get to the point where I didn't want him around is when he started talking about the Bible being full of fairy tales and that uh, God was the invisible man in the sky and those type of things. Well, I never, uh, probably there wasn't a Saturday that I didn't take at least 13 seconds to preach to the guy, you know, at least try to witness to him. Well, two weeks ago, we got the word that he had a massive stroke on a Thursday, 51 years old, massive oh. stroke. And uh, I felt an overwhelming urge to go to him and say, you're alive today for a reason. Right. Okay, This stroke should have knocked you down right away, but you're still alive. And I think the reason you're alive is God wants you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And Mikey, I want you to do that with me right here. Well, he was not only in ICU, but he was in the emergency ICU. They never moved him out of the emergency room. And they promised me that I could go in and see him. This happened on a Thursday. They promised I could go in and see him on a Monday. And I prayed about it all weekend. I was heavy in it, too, at the weekend. I won't ruin the end of the movie for you guys, but when you go to the movie God's Not Dead, you'll realize the end of that movie was very significant emotionally to me based on what was going on with Mikey. Because I'm thinking about Mikey the whole time. Right. All right? The movie's over. The credits are rolling. I open my phone. I turn it on, and there's a text. Mike's dead. He's gone. Mm. And I was crushed. I was absolutely crushed. Not because I lost a friend, but I knew I'd never see him again. And eternity had slipped through his hands, and maybe I could have had something to do with it. Tuesday morning, I got a call from his sister that said, Mac, I want you to know that in the last few hours of his being conscious, he was asking for you. And his comment was, get Mac for me. He knows Jesus. And this startled his, you know who we're talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, here. I know exactly who yeah. you're talking about. Know the whole story. Yeah, you know the whole yeah, story. Right. I just remembered that. Right, right. Yeah, you go to church with right, Mike. Right. All right. Yeah. So do you know how it ended? Well, I, tell me what your side well, of the story is. They brought pastors in right. from his church, and he accepted Jesus. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But to think that it was my name, it was, it was those 10 years of badgering him in a nice way, but badgering him. And when that moment came, he said, get Mac. He knows Jesus. And by saying that, right. they knew to bring in the pastors from yeah. his home church, where he was, right. where he grew up with. Wow, that's yeah. just that's an incredible story. I'll never forget that story as long as I live. Never. And it was that it was that forty eight hours between I found out he's dead, and I heard that that I was so I was just, guys, I was just in pain. I thought, man, I blew it. I blew it. This guy asked for me, or I'm sorry, I, I wanted to go see this guy, but I couldn't because I wasn't family. And you know what, probably. Jane I, I, Jane, I probably could have got in. You know me. I would have <laughs> pushed way my in. way in or yeah. whatever. But I didn't. But, but anyway, it all but worked I think, out But good I think what end. it really points out to is that we all integrate, integrate with each other. And I think God gives us an opportunity to impact other people's lives. And to the degree that we are willing to use that influence to draw people, people closer to Jesus Christ is the, the degree that will be used. And we have to be willing and able and ability. Be, uh, available yeah. to be used. If you would have said, well, you know, just forget about him and 
and keep playing and learning about poker and learning from him and all well, that, or, not engaging it, we're not even caring. Or, or just not letting him come. Yeah, you right. Know, you can't right, come because right, you talk you bad know. about Jesus. Right. But, right. but my, it was, and I give my credit to my wife because she said once, well, maybe this is the only place he hears about it. Right. Can you, I can imagine the people, some of the people, the Christians, the hardcore Christians that, that I come from, they're hearing you talk about poker and they're starting to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. You're such a heathen. You call yourself a Christian. Yeah. And yet here's a guy that probably wouldn't be in the kingdom because of your willingness to sit down with him and legitimately play yeah. a game with him and talk to him about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, I'm just. But, I'm, but the interesting thing about it, we all have stories like that in our lives where missed opportunities, but we also have opportunities to hear the gospel and influence other people through it. And Jane, you have a story too. Yeah. And it's interesting. The segue I could take to that is because people didn't give up on me is right. the reason that I'm here and living the beautiful life that I'm living now. Right. It's people um, kept on me and uh, cared enough and loved enough to see me through this, to these, to this other side. When, when, when did, when did the drinking pick up to the point where people were going, Hey Jane, you, you okay? I mean, I'm a little concerned. It I mean, was, um, I mean, was it an OWI? No, nope, never had any legal trouble. Okay. Um, and I think it was just, it started, uh, let's see. I lived by myself for a few years bouncing around the country with my work. And um, I think that's where I settled into it. And it became more of a pattern for me okay. would be go home, get a bottle of wine, get two bottles of wine, um, some beer. You know, um, I was never a hard liquor drinker, but I started to see these bottles piling up and going, well, this is not great, but yeah. well, it's just I'm at this period in my life. Um, and so I, I didn't think much about it because I was still getting up, going to work, doing my life. Um, when I got married and had kids, uh, I never drank in my pregnancies. And um, to See, me, that was a sign. That you're not an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. Yeah, I, I, I'm always amazed by that because most, I don't know most, it just seems to me that a lot of women that I know who are in the program would tell you, but boy, for those nine months. Didn't touch it. Didn't touch didn't it. Didn't think so about it. What is that? That's that maternal power overcoming the addiction? I think so. That's it's pretty true incredible. for me. I just, I knew it was not going to be a part of my life during those months. Yeah. And I had, we had our children very quickly. Uh, they're 15 months apart. And so um, during the pregnancy, and I, the yep, funny part is I look at my husband, two, two, two kids, children. Two kids. I look at my husband and I say, I, I want to, I felt great during my pregnancies. I felt absolutely fantastic. And years later, now we're looking back, I wasn't drinking. Yeah. It wa I wasn't <laughs> drinking. And that's, yeah. I think, big reason why I, I felt so great. Question. Um, the, the, the wine bottles. You, yes. You got a deposit on those, right? I, there were too many to count, usually. So I didn't. You didn't take them in? No. See, I didn't take my gin bottles in because I would be taking, I'd be taking right. 10 bottles at a time. And I, I didn't want to look like that. <laughs> so I'd throw that. 10 cents, start, 15 cents away. away. Right. Wow. And yeah, when you start to know around town where you can dump bottles secretly, yeah. Yeah. you know you have a problem when you have a relationship with dumpsters. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's <laughs> yes. true. All right. So um, so I guess, yes, when it started to pick up, um, after I quit working full time and I was taking care of two small children, um, I couldn't wait for five o'clock when my husband would be home and I could say, this is my time. I'm relaxing. Mm. And um, get the kids to bed. And then my time turned into every night drinking a bottle or two of wine. And it would be three or four in the morning. And he doesn't drink. He does not drink. And yeah. that's by his choice. Yeah. He's not an alcoholic. He had uh, family members that had married alcoholics. So he knew about alcoholism a lot more than I did. Um, but for him to watch me and seeing these bottles add up, then I started to hide it because he started to be concerned. Yeah. And um, that's where the hiding bottles came in and um, relationship with dumpsters. And it did start to creep earlier in the day. Um, I'm ashamed to admit, but uh, it would be three o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock, and I'd be pouring myself a glass of wine and um, just wanting a break with, with two small children. And that's obviously a terrible thing to be doing. It's Jane's story. Is it your story? Is it someone you know story? That's why we do this radio program every Sunday. We're not really talking to the addicts or the alcoholics. We're talking to us, the parents, the fathers, the mothers, the brothers, the sisters, the co-workers, the pastors. When we come back, what happened? What happened that made Jane finally say enough is enough? 
I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Restoring hope. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program, Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships. Transform your world. Learn more now at RestoringHopeLive.com. The Pocket Testament League presents Pocket Power. Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. Tongue-tied when it comes to witnessing? Then let God's Word do the talking for you. My local youth group will feed and hang out with the homeless downtown. Such a cosmopolitan city is a huge meeting place for people of all walks of life. And having access to God's Word would be a huge help. The truth has to be shared. Hello, this is Mike Brickley, president of the Pocket Testament League. Reading the Bible every day is so easy when you always have it with you. You won't even need a backpack. You can carry one right in your pocket. What are you waiting for? Our Women's Fellowship has sponsored a car wash to raise money, but we also want to use this opportunity to share the gospel. That will be our thank you. Praise the Lord for having these testaments available. What are you waiting for? Read, carry, and share the gospel every day. For more information, call 1-800-636-8785 or visit pocketpower.org. That's pocketpower.org. So, you know, I'm a dog, and I'm kind of new to this family, but I've noticed a trend. My humans do this thing where they go around and get all my toys and hide them in this basket, but it's always the same basket, and it's always the same place. And then they act so surprised when I find them, but I'm like, Hello? That's where you put it last time. Humans are the worst at hide-and-go-seek. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Here's Dan Celia with today's Stewardship Moment. I had a doctor friend of mine say, I've never heard you speak about stewardship of our health. If we are going to be servants of the Lord, we need to take care of ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. Well, in that context of 1 Corinthians, I'm not sure the Lord was speaking about the stewardship of our body or our health, but he does say we have received it from God and it's not our own. Our health should certainly be a part of healthy stewardship. You've just heard a stewardship moment with Dan Celia of the Regency Foundation, helping you plan, give, and invest wisely. Call them at 877-4-PLAN-WISE or log on to regencyfoundation.org. That's regencyfoundation.org. Today, millions are struggling with alcohol or drug addiction. If you or people you know struggle with a chemical dependency where a substance owns you and you have other struggles such as depression, anxiety, or trauma that can often go along with it, get your freedom back and successfully transform your life from one controlled by addiction to a clean, sober, fulfilling life. Contact Transformations Treatment Center, where our caring professionals will help you find your freedom. Transformations Treatment Center offers both a 12-step and a Christian 12-step program, providing healing for the mind, body, and spirit. At Transformations Treatment Center, we understand the pain. Get your freedom back. Transform your world. Addiction specialists are ready to take your call. Call now, 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. That's 877-989-5758. Restoring hope. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. Thanks for joining us for Restoring Hope Live. You can go to our website, RestoringHopeLive.com. Met some uh, neat people uh, through this uh, program. Uh, I'm thinking about Gator Fred, who uh, wrote to me many, many months ago and said that uh, 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 I've never been married, uh, my mom's still alive, and I've got an old dog, and when my mom, an old dog, dies, I'm going to commit suicide. And he was serious. And so he allowed me to uh, come back and forth with him a little bit. 
And um, I don't know if we made a difference in his life or not, but we're talking. You know, we're sharing emails. Right. And Kayla sent us a a note about how uh, uh, she had a a much better understanding of somebody in her family and the problems that they face. Because kind of like you said, Jane, alcoholics are old guys living under the bridge with paper bags and bottles. Right. Yeah. They're not walking around every day. Yeah. They're not next to us. They're not in church with us. Uh, I love my pastor. And I've said this before. I love my pastor one day when he pointed at a row in church and he said, there's 10 of you in that row. He said, two of you are alcoholics. One of you abuses prescription drugs. Two of you are into pornography. You're having an affair and stop it. And then Mm -hmm. he went down. And by the time he got to the end, it was all 10. It was all 10 of us. Mm-hmm. We're all busted. Right. Uh, of course, that wasn't a Baptist church. That was the <laughs> Lutherans who are willing to admit they're wrong. But uh, <laughs> He's got more more to point at it in a Lutheran church than a Baptist church. I guess church. so. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. But um, uh, so thanks for listening to this show. And uh, uh, we appreciate our supporters, which is Transformations Treatment Center down in Florida. Uh, you can go to our website and get that number. Just call them. Ask them questions. Uh, Little men in white coats won't come up with sirens on and take you or whoever you're talking about away. We understand that having an intervention or uh, uh, going to someone that you love and saying, listen, you need to make a change or else. And I don't know if you've ever heard this. Uh, As a parent, I said this to my children many, many times. It's really harder on me to ground you or to punish you than it is on you. Because it really hurts me that I have to take that joy away from you for an hour in the corner or 10 days without TV or whatever it is. So it's hard to walk up to somebody you love and say, this is it. I I, I can't enable you anymore with your disease or your addict or your habit or hurt or hang up. It's this program, Restoring Hope Live, that kind of helps you get some information. And transformations will help you a lot on that. So give them a call. Uh, Dr. and Pastor Mike Hartwig is in the house today as my co-host, and we're talking with Jane. So where are we now? We are your how old uh, with two brand new babies? Uh, 36. All right. And a wonderful marriage. Your husband is one of my favorite people in the whole world. I love him, too. Uh, He didn't (laughs) suspect anything before the kids were born? He knew. um he knew that uh, I drank and drank to excess and and frequently, but again, I never had any trouble with the law. Never, most of the time, I'm at home or with close friends. I was never out and about, um, and so yeah. But again, we don't have any kids. We were newly married or dating, and it was just um, he saw the red flags, but so he didn't. It wasn't as bad as it got. Were, were, you, were you an argumentative drunk? Were you a horny drunk? Were you a, <laughs> a sassy drunk? Were you a just go to sleep drunk? I would say sassy and then go to sleep. I okay. wasn't. Um, later, when confronted about my drinking, it, it got ugly. Okay. Um, but uh, before before marriage, before kids, it was just kind of fun and having friends over. I always had an excuse to have friends over and have a party and. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't a bad situation until confronted on it, and then I started to be hiding it. Yeah, and um, switched to hard alcohol, which my body was not used to. Really? Yes, to hide the bottles. Oh. So wine bottles add up, and yeah. oh. uh, you get a bottle of vodka, you can hide it easier. See, I never hid anything. I, I, my, oh gosh, I, I kept my booze in the freezer. You know, that's where my gin was. So my wife always knew. So when I quit drinking, it was kind of obvious. But, oh. we, but we still have, and I imagine you do, we still have liquor in our house because we have friends. We have We guests. don't. Don't you? You we don't do have not. any? Okay. No. Uh, you but don't have I would... any friends or any liquor? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of friends, a lot of great friends who I would have over uh, that were my age from from high school and college and, and drank with them. And they're still so close with me now because they've Good. gone through this with me. I'm very upfront about it. And um, So was there a pivot point where everything, all right, this is a problem? Yeah. What was it? Um, there was no event, but it, my my parents came over, sat down with my husband, um, and said, "You do you know you have a problem with alcohol?" And I would say I was a problem drinker. I wasn't going to say I was an alcoholic. And this went on for months. So the question was, "Do you know you have a problem with alcohol?" Yes, and that the was answer the was yes, but I wouldn't say I was an alcoholic. And how'd you respond to that? I can handle this. I can cut it back. I, I, I'm not out of control. Yes, I'm, it's stressful with two young children. Yes, it's a problem, and I'm drinking this much, and it bothers you. It scares you. Um, and uh, But I can handle it. So what was their response? 
Let's see. Yeah, let's see, right. My dad, um, a very patient man, he'd read the big book from cover to cover. They encouraged me to do some AA meetings, and I dabbled for a while with AA meetings. But So I did thought, they come to you with a me. book? They came to you with a book and say, hey, let's work through this together? Or how um, did yeah. Uh, my dad pointed me in the direction of a colleague of his, and she came over and sat down with me and gave me a big book and, and talked. But at the same time, in my head, I'm going, I'm not that bad. Mm. This isn't that bad. Right. Um, what really did it uh, for me was I, my husband and I were uh, updating our life insurance and took a blood test for life insurance. And I was denied life insurance in my 30s because my liver was shot. Oh, and my. they could tell that by the by the blood test. By the blood test. Yep. So that you couldn't get life insurance. Could not get life insurance at that time. And to be that age and to be told, you know, we don't even want your money. That was scary. That was very scary. But I still kept drinking. Yeah. Still kept hiding it better, or so I thought. So you kept on dabbling with getting help and, yes. and all that? Yes. And uh, my father passed away mm. before I became sober. Mm -hmm. um, coming up on May 20th is his two-year anniversary of his passing. Um, and I didn't go to treatment until um, after Thanksgiving of the year he died. So that would have been 2012. So when you find out he dies, when, when you're confronted with that, what was your reaction? Did you run to a bottle? I didn't run to a bottle. Um, or did you stay away from it? No, I didn't stay away from it because I know dad wouldn't want me to drink. No, no, I, I, I still drank. I was at that point terrified because I knew the love and the, his hopes for me. It was it was very upsetting. Well, and and right. he left something to you. He did. He left in his will funds that were specifically designated for me to go to treatment because yeah. he wow. knew that I would need it, and eventually I did. Um, after about six months after he'd passed. So how did you, how did the lawyer or the executor tell you all that? No, I'm my, uh, uh, the doctor that I'd gone to, um, uh, with, my your liver. with my liver <laughs> issue, um, it was an intervention situation. Um, I went to his office for a checkup and he said, let's go get better. Walked in the other room and there was my husband, my mother, a friend of mine that's been in AA for about eight years and they said, you got to go. You got a plane ticket today, and wow. you're going. Wow. Did and they li they give you an option? Did they no. say, that you are going regardless? You are going. And, 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 and at that moment, did you surrender, or were you upset? I Part of me was so excited to go and deal with this and see if some treatment could actually work. But I said, no, I'm not going. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. But a part of me was relieved, okay. honestly. Yeah. I had been fighting and hiding this for so long. I didn't know that that it could get better. And I didn't know that I was terrified at the idea of not having alcohol in my life. Absolutely terrified. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I'd deal with my anxiety. I didn't know any better. This was the only thing that I'd clung to to make me feel calm. And um I did not want to let that go. It had its claws in me pretty deep. Did you ever try uh, uh, legal over the uh, legal or over the counter prescriptions to calm that anxiety? I did. I um, and I've settled into um, um, anti anxiety medication that it works very well for me. Um, at one point, they'd switched me to a derivative of Xanax, mm -hmm. but this was right when Whitney Houston died, right. and that was announced as being so uh, such a contributory part of her right. death that I was scared of it and it made me feel like a zombie and I did yeah. not like that something that strong but I definitely needed to find a balance that didn't involve alcohol so I do take an anti-anxiety medicine now Good. which what would you helps. say to parents that are hearing you this and they maybe see some of this that you were going through in their daughter what would you say to them confronting the alcohol straight on um was made me buff up and get defensive and what really helped was when my dad said, aren't you sick of living with this anxiety and with this hiding and with this lying? You know, getting around to the deeper emotions of what are you trying to do? And listening as opposed to just being angry about the the alcohol. But he was also confronted and said, we, this, you cannot live your life this way. You cannot do this. This is not a way to live your life. And I remember at one point he did look at me and say, alcohol has become your God. And oh, that wow. 
ripped me to the core. Wow. Because you had a faith base. I do. I'd gone a long way from it. But you had it. I mean, yeah, you, and I, you went a long way from it, but you still had a creator and you knew who he was and you had a savior and you knew who he was. Exactly. But but, that, but that's easy to push away. I, I That's my story, too. So, you know, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear the word God and you want to run. At you, that point, yeah, because I was running and hiding from everything. Yeah, you don't want to have anything in, in your life that even represents God. No. I. Um, Jane is our guest. She's telling her story today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hartwig, of course, here with me, and Eric and Maddie producing. Uh, we thank you for uh, listening. Um, all right, so you go to treatment, and boy, you go to treatment, and you come home, and everything's wait, great, and that's wait, the end of the story. Wait, wait, wait. L- tell me what happened at treatment. What did they do? Well, they see you in the room? Well, no, oh, you can't at, treatment. at treatment. Oh. At treatment. Um, I went to a treatment facility in Minnesota for four weeks. And Minnesota? Minnesota in the winter, <laughs> around the holiday season. That would drive some people to drink. With two little children at home. It was hard. I did not want to go. Um, for how long? For four weeks. Four weeks. And um, First week, what do they do? They dress you up in a, in a white coat no, and strap you down? And no. It was, there was a period of detox um, where I didn't... I, I knew I was physically dependent on alcohol because I'd start, my routine had been I'd, I'd started drinking early in the morning, too, because I was getting shakes and having a glass of wine or something early in the morning to just steady myself so I could get through my day. Okay. Um, so I knew so I was you going to have detox, withdrawal. When you, when you say detox, we're going to just remove all the alcohol from you. Yes. And and let's see what happens. Yes. They do anything to make sure that you're going to be okay physically. Yeah, they were monitoring you. And they, um, is it Librium? Okay. Um, yeah. To help with the, the um, easing off um, those symptoms. And I was um, put in a unit with these wonderful women, about 20 women. They were all like me. They were moms. They were professionals. They, some of them had legal trouble. Um, some of them didn't. But they, it, it was the same story, mm. same exact story over and over. People saying, "I can handle this on my own." No, you can't. Uh, family concerned. Um, Did you see it yourself in the other people oh saying, yeah. "They don't. They're uh, they're drunks and they don't even know it." Yeah. That's the kind of stuff. And it was working in small groups, working with counselors, and talking about these things that right. it became clear. Oh yeah, you belong here. I belong here. Yeah. This this is my my story. This is what I'm doing. And and seeing that a lot of the ways my life could have gone, but a lot of them had a lot of serious other legal trouble or other issues with their families that, thankfully, um, I won't have in my life. Yeah. Where was Jesus in all that? In that de- in that detox in that four weeks. Uh, th- there was a religious component to the um, program. And it was spiritual based, but, but, uh, for me it was Jesus and there was a great bookstore. I, I was reading a lot and that was encouraged and sharing, um, a quiet time is how I can describe it to reflect. Hmm. And you felt that anxiety is starting to be released. Yes. Wow. Jane is our guest today. We're uh, uh, talking about her story. Now, uh, we'd all like to stand up and say that you came home from treatment and the balloons went into the air and that was the first day of sobriety. Wrong. Right. What happened? Uh, Came back after four weeks. So glad to be back with my family. Um, And then the normal normal pressures of life slip in. Yeah, started living life on life's terms. Uh, Yeah, uh, trying to. And... um, was fine, not fine. I things were okay for about two months, and um, let's see. I came back in January and um, got back into the swing of things, but still thought that that wasn't real. That that I can still handle this. I'm not going to give this up, and uh, so I would. I snuck home a bottle of wine, and um, everybody went to bed. I thought, okay, let's let's try this. It was it, it started me on a path of drinking again every day. And and they always say, and it's true, you don't start slowly; you go right back right to back where you to were. where you were. And when did when did your husband realize this was going on? How many immediately that day, that night, next morning, next morning. Yeah, he knew. <laughs> and then what did he say? Just the look in his eyes, the disappointment, this fear. Yeah, absolute fear. How did he know? He just knows the tone of my voice or 
he just knows me so well. Yeah. And um, so you weren't sneaking around then. Or oh, were I was you? trying oh, to. You were trying to. Yeah. And um, and I, I Mike, I remember that period of time because Patrick and I would talk, and he would just pull his hair out. He was just pulling his hair out. Didn't know what to do. He wasn't going to send you back to treatment. No. Why not? So expensive. Yeah. Hmm. So We've done that. So, um, finally, I I I'd had enough, and my the anniversary of the one year anniversary of my dad's passing was coming up, May twentieth, mm-hmm. and I said, Sweet, I can't stop this. I want to go on antibiotics. Yeah, and for those of you that don't know, Anabuse is a uh, prescription that you receive, and you take it once a day. Once a day. And it's just a little pill. But any alcohol gets in your system, you get violently ill. And I'm talking about deodorant. I'm talking about mouthwash. I'm talking about you go to Biagi's and have a little clam sauce with your salad, and there's wine in there, right? And, and right. what else? Perfumes. Okay. Um, the the squirt soap, the anti disinfect or the uh, yeah. antibacterial soap, anything like that. Um, you can't have touch even touch your skin. And thankfully, I never tried out uh, to see. Oh, wonder what would happen with, with never. taking this. I was never that dumb. And you um, violently throw up. Throw up. It's like the worst flu you've ever had. Yeah. Your face gets red. It just is. It really sens- it makes your body extremely sensitive to alcohol. Sure. Yeah. And so, uh, but the good news is you never tested it and you didn't accidentally do something that made it test. There was one time when, uh, I did not, there was one time when I had, uh, some sore muscles after working out and my husband had some cream to put on and it, we felt it was like an icy hot type of thing. And, um, so I wonder if there's alcohol in this and he looked and I could see on his face and I ran and jumped in the shower. Cause I was <laughs> like, I don't even want to see if what's going to happen here, but thankfully I did not. And but Some you people don't, with, say with that drug, you'd really don't deal with the root issue, though. Well, and that's what I was just getting to. Some people say, well, isn't that a crutch? <laughs> and I'll I talked it. about it a lot with my sponsor. And she said, whatever is going to keep you sober. Yeah, right. And for the first few months, that was was helping me. I would have to say I'd had such a radical shift in my m- mind um, from coming back to treatment, seeing how bad it got. And then making this decision to go on the end abuse and starting as that is my day. And those first few months were hard. And that was a thought, oh, I could just pull off at this gas station and grab something real quick. Oh, no, I can't. Mm. That stopped me. And I'm thankful for that. Mm-hmm. As these months have gone on, I am truly, oh, my gosh, the change in my life mm-hmm. in the past mm-hmm. 11 months, the peace I feel the mm-hmm. calmness I feel, the not having to hide, and I can just enjoy my life. I haven't done that since I was 16. Yeah. And I, um, it, so it, it, yes, it helped me those first few critical months, mm-hmm. but I've dealt now with ongoing treatment, counseling meetings with a lot of those other issues. I just needed that. I needed a something to give me a footing to be able to get those months to feel these great things to see the benefits of not having alcohol be a part of my life and just living that that it's it's been worth it Mm. for me uh i remember uh after my owi and i had to have a blow and go everybody knows what that is you have to blow into this thing and if you don't have any alcohol in your voice and it allows your car to start and every so many minutes or miles you have to redo it when my year was up to have that in my car, I left it in my car. Really? Because I was bound and determined to never drink and drive again, and I never did. Now, the sad thing was I drank for another six years, but I never drank and drove ever, ever again. Wow. And just left that in my car. So there are those crutches out there, and call us weak to use them. I think we're pretty smart to I take what's out there and and use it and and use it to our advantage to keep us sober or at least keep us in my case keep me off the road and drunk. Right. All right. So are you still on the antibuse? I um I have gone off of it this week. This week. This mm. week. I and am, I haven't touched anything. You're, you're not scared? I'm not. Why, I went, Why would you just stay on the antibuse? I'm coming up on 1 year. Okay. And I want to be able I've talked about this with my sponsor. Okay that I feel ready to go off of it. And I want to be able to say I'm at a year 
and I did a month of it without. Okay. On my on on my own. Now, I, if I were you, and I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying, if I were you, I'd have that bottle of Anabuse or at least a pill in my pocket at all time. So when I got that urge to go to the liquor store or the grocery store to buy liquor, I'd pop that pill. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. You know, knowing, you know, it's kind of like that that break glass to get your last cigarette type of thing. <laughs> uh, this is my, I'm not going to drink for sure. And if I pop that pill, I know that I can't drink. And if I do, everybody's going to know. That's a really good idea. Well, I hadn't uh, thought about that. Because I thought about going on an abuse uh, when I was trying to quit drinking. Because I tried to quit drinking for almost five years before I finally humbled myself to go to a 12-step program. Because like you, that's not for me. Right. In fact, for me to go to a 12-step program, I actually reached out to some guys that I knew were in the program, and they introduced me to some more guys. And I realized these guys are just like me. They're professional. They go to work every day. They've got families. They've, they have a name in the, in the marketplace. But every Wednesday, there's the governor's assistant, and there's that judge, and there's that other radio guy and that other TV guy, and we're all, we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. And I needed that. But I, I bought a bottle of abuse, never took it, because of all the uh, – let me back up, Jane. I made an excuse because of all the other – the deodorant, the mouthwash, the aftershave. I wasn't going to deal with any of that. And so I probably still have that bottle of abuse. Now it's 10 <laughs> years old. But uh, I would strongly encourage, and I'm sure you would too, if, if you want to stop drinking and you really, really want to stop drinking, go to your doctor and get abuse. You, you know, your doctor's not going to make a big deal out of it. Get the antabuse and try it. It's not an expensive drug. It doesn't have any side effects, right? Nope. Do whatever you can. How's your, how's your liver? Liver is doing great. I've had <laughs> periodic checks with my doctor. Yeah. And um, thankfully, it, it, so, it has it's been remarkable. Yeah, the, li the liver can rejuvenate itself. Sure. Yeah, there's different uh, uh, medication, not medication, supplements and things you can take uh, that helps you do that. Well... Jane, I sure appreciate you coming in here today. Thank you. I'm so happy for you. I love you so Thank much. Thank you. I'm so happy too. Yeah, I know you are, and you you just you deserve what you're getting. Thank you. Really you. Do. Thanks yeah. for this opportunity to share. Oh, no problem. Welcome anytime. Uh, Mike, you don't know this, but for Lent, you know how I always end these programs. Mm -hmm. I always ask people to do what? Pray. Right. For Lent, here's what I changed. Uh, I'm asking you to think about somebody that you hate, that you can't stand that's really hurt you, that that resentment is so deep, even the sound of their name causes your skin to crawl. Someone that you absolutely could never give over to Jesus because you don't want to have that accountability or that responsibility. So for this Lent, what I'm asking you to do is to forgive that person. How do you forgive them? If you don't know how, here's how you do it. Seriously, here's how you forgive somebody that you hate that much. You pray for them. You pray that they're happy. You pray that they're healthy. You pray that they get everything in life that they want. No disparaging, I hope they get what they deserve. None of that. You honestly pray for them. Do that for 30 days, and God will change your heart, and you never know, you might have a new friend in your life. So for my gift to you for this Lenten season, pray for someone who has hurt you. And we'll see you next week live here on RestoringHopeLive.com.